So I've had a bit more of a think about this uh, triple rectifier and I think looking at the evidence that this here, this burn in the board, I think that was actually the first fault to occur. So there's, that's that thickest trace there, so it goes thin, thick, thin, thin. That thickest trace is ground. The next trace over is the E node, uh, which is the lowest voltage. Uh, well, actually, no, it's not. 413. Well, it should be the lowest voltage in the uh, in the amp. Uh, so the lowest voltage node in the amp. Schematic says otherwise, but. Um, and then D, the D node. So you've got the E and the D node, which carry about 380-ish, 90-ish volts. Uh, and I reckon that the board has actually broken down between the ground and those two. Uh, and then that's shorted. <clears throat> and then the dropper that supplies those nodes that was there, that has uh, burnt out from shorting to ground. So you've had the full, the full uh, C node across that 15K and um, that's burnt that resistor. So I reckon this was the first thing to occur. I was previously running with the, one of the caps having shorted, but there's no other reason for any damage right here other than the board breaking down itself and burning itself. Basically the board having a bit of contamination in the fob glass or possibly damage to the surface of it or corrosion, spillage, who knows? Um, you can't tell now because it's burnt. But that started the whole cascading failure. Um, so that makes sense. Let's run with it. Right, so now the fun stuff. We've got to cut out the burnt areas of the board because they may be conductive and lead to tracking in the future, which is like basically arcing. We're going to have to recreate the infrastructure of the board. So not only some of the connections to the board, but the traces as well. Going to have to reroute some stuff away from the trouble areas. Then we'll rebuild the circuit and we'll go from there. To do that, I've got my little toy here, the Dremel. Tiny jobs like this is about all it's good for. Oh, it does fret polishing, that kind of thing, but anything more serious and you're really talking a drill press, but it's still pretty cool. So I've got just the standard run of the mill crappy included drill bit in there. I've got full sets of drills and everything, but this is handy and nice and maneuverable. Then once we've uh, drilled a hole to enter the board, we're gonna move to a carbide burr so we can travel uh, laterally as we're enlarging the, the, the cutout as, as much as we need to to get rid of that carbon. So this will be fun. Fiberglass dust is not your friend, so I've got the buffer again. It's got a pre-filter, so it'll catch dust as well as chemicals in the carbon filter. The pre-filter is just a little layer of uh, like Dacron mesh, uh, so that'll pick up any any chunks. And uh, it's got the HEPA filter, so uh, won't be breathing in fiberglass dust because it's not friendly. So uh, I've got that cranked up all the way, so it's probably going to be a bit deafening, but so is the Dremel, so turn your volume down. <laughs> Dentist. Fill the hole there. Another one there. No traces on the bottom that was affected on that one, but we've affected several in that area. And over here. So this one here has gone through, uh, I've drilled out the burnt area, so effectively we'll be rebuilding three traces on the top, and underneath is unrelated traces uh, to the failure, and there's three traces there we'll have to rebuild as well. So we'll run some, uh, run some wire from pad to pad, 
I'm not a fan of running fires, uh, fires, wires in midair floating above a hole in the board. We could refill it with epoxy, but then you've got to take into account is the epoxy rated at 400 volts? Is it going to break down too? And that's stuff that's pretty hard to find data on, uh, plus mix ratios of the resins will affect their properties, and it's just a whole other ball game. So we're just going to remove the burnt stuff, we're going to run some wires, and we'll use some conformal coat where we need to, if we need to make a connection on a trace. Um, but if we can connect to the nearest pad, we'll just run the wire and we'll use some masking tape to hold it in place. We'll just put a few tiny little dabs of silicon to hold the wire where we want it and uh, secure it for the future. So I've got my carbide burr on there now and we can enlarge the holes to try and get rid of the majority of the carbon. So let's look at this one. Getting blocked in the carbide bit a little bit. Clear those flutes. Go a bit slower this time. Still a cutting edge, so that's promising. How far do we have to go? Say we... Probably just get rid of the furry stuff. I don't think we'll make any connections to that area. Burnt, 
was a Trailer Park Boys reference. We've removed all the burnt bits of uh, fiberglass. Now uh, we've left that trace down there, and we've left this trace over here, and they're in solid fiberglass still. So uh, I think they'll be happy. And we'll run wires across this gap. So over to this one. This one's a bit a little bit further, still burnt around that last pad. Awesome, looks terrible, just like it should. Now we've got some, uh, we've cleaned up the holes, smoothed the edges of them, cleaned up any furriness and dags. So now we've got some uh, conformal coating in this pen. Now it's clear, it's like the old uh, liquid paper pen. Got to give it a bit of a prime up. And we'll just seal the edges of that cut just so uh, if there is any gaps in the lamination it doesn't absorb any moisture it's pretty uh, pretty pretty thin fluid this stuff so just get a bit on there it's almost like water thin just flow it around and fiberglass soaks it up wherever it needs to Sweet as. So here I've uh, removed the bridge rectifier configuration diodes, which supplied DC to the uh, low voltage power supplies. I believe that's for the relays, etc., etc., etc. They derive their voltage from the heater supply, which is AC, obviously. Uh, but they they try to draw too much current from um, even the legs of the diodes were discolored and sort of blue color like they've gotten really hot and it's starting to affect the board under it and you can see how cramped this is you've got that capacitor is literally overlapping them that's shown vertically look I got no idea why they cram so many friggin parts on these boards like they could could have made the board bigger. They could have mounted, I don't know, can caps. There's so many other ways around the solution, like so many better solutions to this issue. But they just jam stuff together, like it, almost like it's fun for them. Um, and then there you've got your standoff. Look, look at the hole for the standoff. It's pretty well touching the hole for the diode. Now, if that had a decent sized pad, which it doesn't, the pads are ridiculous on these things. 
that'd be touching the the standoff. Now it doesn't matter; it's a nylon standoff, but it's just shit design. They just jam stuff in there, and there's no excuse for it really, and there's no reason for it, and they just keep doing it almost like it's some kind of <sighs> compulsion. I don't, I don't understand it, but it'll happen next year. It'll happen the next decade. As long as this company's still in business, it'll keep happening. So I've got some new diodes. There, there were one N four double O sevens that were in there. These are one N, what are they? Fifty two ninety, fifty three ninety two. So they're one point five amp, just general purpose, just a little bit more margin for error. And I'm going to lift them off the board. So uh, basically, I've got my little kinking pliers, my little um, lead forming pliers. So I just I fold them over just by hand and then I use these little chooches to put that kink in it and it just gives really consistent quick results every time so it stops them at a certain point from going through the circuit board you just kink it like that Bob's your auntie and um, that makes it sit above the board a little bit so it allows some airflow and it just keeps them as they get warm they are uh, they're not in contact with the board heating the board they're actually letting some airflow around them and cooling down a little bit and in that tiny cramped little area there um, we need all the help we can get so that's our new little diodes in there floating in midair they're about half an inch uh, probably about 15 mil three quarter of an inch above the board. So that should allow a, a fair bit of airflow now and they'll run a bit cooler. Plus just having the extra lead length gives it a bit more surface area for heat dissipation. <whistles> Bloody hell, I need a holiday after that one. <laughs> so, we've got the caps we're reusing back in. We've replaced the one that got charred. We've replaced that uh, little switch pop suppression cap. We've cut a massive slot through here, which I'll show you zoomed in. So that's cut through the burn section, and that's isolated this bias supply from this high tension, um, which previously had burn tracks between it, which would probably allow leakage and bias drift, which is definitely what we don't want. We've got two new bias caps in there, smaller radial ones to just fit a bit more comfortably. Um, that resistor that used to be there is now mounted off board. Uh, I've run some wires under the board to make up for the, the destroyed traces, which I'll show you in a sec. Um, where else are we? Okay, so working our way across, we've got this, uh, <laughs> it ain't pretty, um, but it'll work. So <laughs> I replaced some of the plate resistors just to get their leads extended on the board so I could use them like little turrets so they're just the same value just with longer leads so I can do some bastardry and underneath which I'll show you in a sec reuse that cap tested okay nothing wrong with it and it's got ridiculously long lead length uh, lead centers lead spacing so the little Panasonics that I use um, much more convenient and in my opinion high quality and less stupid uh, they're much. They're about a tenth of the, or a quarter of the size, a fraction of the size, and uh, they work every bit as well. And uh, putting one of them in though, then I'd have to heat shrink the leads, and the leads are a bit long and it'd be flopping it around. So I reused this one because it was just convenient to fit the old holes, and the old holes were fine, and the traces are okay for that component. And it hides uh, a big hole, which I'll show you in a second. <laughs> I've run a red wire to replace some broken traces uh, from the 22K dropper. Uh, the 15K dropper is flown above them a little bit and goes above where it used to be, where there's a big gaping hole now. I replaced the tantalum, which was charred with an electrolytic. Uh, you can see the little 100K cap down there, uh, resistor down there. That's, believe it or not, a one watt, um, even though it's the size of a quarter watt. I used that size just to fit it and because I've got multiple leads going into single holes, I needed the smaller diameter leads. Um, 
the larger resistors that look more in line with the rest of them, which are, I think they're one watts, carbon comp. Um, the leads were too fat, fit comp two components in the, the one hole. So we needed to have that ability to be able to recreate this whole area with minimal effort. All of this was done the easiest way possible with the least amount of permanent mod modifications to the amp. At a glance, it looks stock. Um, there's no boards flying off or leads in the air. Uh, it's only when you look close that you realize, well, to the trained eye, it doesn't look stock, does it? But, you know, <laughs> there's no allowance for some people. Got two new caps here, 10 microfarad, 450 volts. I've got the obligatory Mesa dollar per silicon between them. <laughs> and let's have a look at the bottom of the board. Hey, eh? zoom out again so I know where I'm at. And the horror show begins. So, we'll start from this side again. <laughs> Get the framing okay. So there, there's the modification of the, well, the rebuilding of the broken traces, basically. And I've used uh, just PVC jacketed wire, 600 volt wire, uh, 21 gauge, I think it was, and um, stranded. So I've got some uh, little dobs of silicon on there holding it to the board. I just sort of use either a bulldog clip or just tape it down until the silicon cures. Little dobs like that cure pretty quickly with this silicon that I use. I've got, I've got to clean up the flux a bit, but I'm waiting for the silicon to dry. I've got the lead from the 30 replacement, uh, 33 microfarad, 500 volt cap for the, uh, for the B node. Uh, the lead extends like the others through the board and then works like a turret. And I was able to wrap some wires around that and then access where the traces used to go. So working our way over, that's the new diodes that I showed you in the previous clip <clears throat> for the low voltage supply, forming a bridge rectifier. And here is the reworking of the damaged area in the preamp. So I've got some very fine gauge wire bridging that hole where the, the hole was burnt through the board. So that was the one I drilled out and then milled sort of with the Dremel. Now I've got some Kynar wire bridging that gap and I'll put a dab of silicon over there to secure the wires just to, you know, if someone pulls the board out, doesn't realize it's there and their finger goes down there, it's, it's a little bit delicate in that area. So I just locked it all into place with a blob of silicon. We've got another wire there making up where there was a trace under where that burnt 15K was. Now there's a slot there to also uh, just get rid of all the charred shit. And we've got a green wire, which is the ground that goes to that header. Uh, that was another slightly thicker trace on the other side of the board. Um, I've put it down here just because just this room uh, it wasn't clashing with anything down here. Those caps, those uh, caps there are a bit close to the board to run a wire next to them. So I'm gonna go over this and just make sure all my connections are good. Check continuity. I've already done it, but I'll just double check, triple check, quadruple check. And then uh, we'll start getting it ready to reconnect everything and um, fire it up and give it some testing. So wish me luck, eh? <laughs> uh, another interesting thing of note on this amp uh, when I was testing continuity just to make sure everything was hooked up right. Half the board is grounded at one point and the other half's grounded at one another point. You've got a screw on the chassis near the power transformer. That grounds the chassis and the references the board to the chassis for everything up to some undefined point in the board. And then everything in the preamp is grounded at the input. Um, and it's like, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking out of school here, but it's like they misunderstand the purpose of the ground wires. Because the one... Well, no, no return current should go through the chassis anyway. Uh, well, it does on vintage fenders and stuff, but on this design it shouldn't. But the wire on the power transformer side is like, like 24 gauge, 26 gauge, super thin wire. And then the one, 
The one that they connect to the input jack to tie the input jack to the ground on the board. It's like bloody 14 gauge wire. It's so thick and friggin' unwieldy. And what they've done is in the board, you can see down underneath there, there's a little, a bit hard to make out, but I can't zoom in any further. There's a little hole in between those two resistor pins, leads, and that was supposed to take this wire. But this is like twice the diameter of it. So all they did was they just blobbed solder on there and just like tack soldered this to it. And that's your main ground for, for all your preamp <laughs> circuitry. So that ties back through the chassis to the ground for, well, mounted near the power transformer and then back into the board for your chassis ground reference. Well, not just reference, but your return currents for all your preamp tubes in your, in your front end. It's just, it's like they've gotten all the rules of grounding and just flipped them on its head and said, we'll do the exact opposite of what you should. So anyway, I'm going to rip this yellow wire out. I'm going to put a sensibly sized black one uh, in there. And they've got no coax on the input either, which is a bit weird for such a high gain amp. Uh, maybe I'll just replace the whole lot with coax and run the ground wire over to that point over there or a more convenient point nearby as long as they're both connected. Yeah, it's like, to get, to get a mess that'll work, because I, I can give this back, and the customer might say it's noisy. And who am I to say it was beforehand? I, I don't know, the thing came in cooked. So, even though I'm returning it to the orig original circuit of the messer, it's my word against the customers as to whether it's noisier or less noisy than it was before they brought it in. It's like you've got to reverse engineer the amplifier. I'm not whinging about this, it's kind of fun. <laughs> you've got to reverse engineer the amplifier to make it better. And Messer don't make that easy with their no um, component designators on the board. Um, it doesn't say, you know, R24, it just has a value under the resistor and it doesn't correspond to anything on the schematic. Um, schematics are often inaccurate and completely wrong. Um, they make field revisions on the fly and don't document them. So, yeah, they're fun. But, um, hey, someone's got to do it, eh? All right, champions. Let's fire it up, eh? That's good. <laughs> so that's uh, just the main power switch on now. Let it warm up. Give it a bit of signal, eh? I've reconnected everything. I've made a few little uh, corrections, let's just say. <laughs> Mess of being what they are. So, here goes nothing. clean channel and of course uh, what more convenient place to put the channel switch than on the rear panel <laughs> so if you don't have a foot switch you got to reach around behind the amp give it a reach around double duck right over the back of the amp and um, click between your channels now, there's a bit of popping there it's not dramatic I don't think we've got shorted FETs but I'll just double check that there aren't any in the signal chain seems like the first time you click it when you first power it on, there's a, a pop with the first switching, but after that, it's it's reasonably polite. Um, so yeah, there's, there's ducking fets or muting fets or whatever you want to call them all the way through the thing because they've got relay galore. There's no real good way to completely eliminate um, clicking and popping when you're changing channels on a relay amp, you can use um, pull down resistors and, and whatever and that, that gets rid of most of it, but um, but they probably didn't. <laughs> so they've used this complex capacitor pulse generation that goes through and sends a pulse to all the FETs and shorts all the, uh, the signal or the relay outputs to ground for a fraction of a second every time you click channels. So you'll probably hear the signal cut out there for a, fra for a fracco of a second. 
A fracco is Aussie term for a wee bit, a smidge, uh, a bee's dick, that kind of thing. A little bit of pop in there, but it probably sounds louder on camera than it is. It's actually pretty polite. Most important thing is it's sounding really good. Um, this is probably one of the only messes tone-wise that I don't. Uh, it nails all, everything sounds great with everything at noon, everything at 12 o'clock. And to, to me, that's a good amp. That's a well-designed amp. Um, everything sounds good at 12 o'clock. And um, it sounds like so many records that I grew up listening to with everything set at 12 o'clock. It's, it's for all the design issues and whatever. Um, they really stole the correct parts of Marshall Circuits on this one. <laughs> I'm just a real sucker for um, cathode follower distortion. So any of those classic high gain designs. on the clean and then there's a switch that goes pushed which gets you into the territory I like to be in where it's just on the edge of break up on the clean channel that's where I like to live Also good for your sound engineer if you don't have tons of gain and you're trying to play a gig where people can actually hear your notes, which I know is confronting, but it does happen. <laughs> so, let's go on to the next channel. There you go. Quintessential rock and metal tone. like a bit of scooping there that they're not telling you about. It's humming a bit when I stand too close. Uh, so that's on modern mode, so that sounds a little bit scooped. Go on to vintage. It sounds a bit darker. Lower level too. Um, whatever, I'll have to look at the circuit, but whatever uh, EQ they're doing there, they're not compensating for the level changes. Then you got raw. Raw! It's raw! And uh, then on to the third channel, which is the red channel, the high gain one. Oh, I went the wrong way. Hello. There we go. <laughs> Pots need a clean still. I'll do that afterwards and just proof of concept that all my uh, hackery worked. So we're reading the bias there on one of the six, <clears throat> six valves on either side. I don't have the rectifier valves installed. I've got a second theory that maybe one of them short and it fed AC to all the HT and maybe some of the caps went short for, for a moment there and maybe that's what caused that failure downstream. And they look pretty buggered. There's a lot of vaporized metal on the inside of the glass envelope. Um, so this came in in solid state mode on the switch on the back. So I'm going to ask the customer if he wants to just leave them out because you can do that. Um, it generates less heat because those heaters are always on in the back. Um, the voltages are within spec without them installed so that's fine. And um, 
maybe just leave them out. But if he does want them installed, I'll just uh, I'll I'll pop three of them on the invoice as well and just just um, install them when they come in. Probably a couple of days away. I've got one here, but I don't generally stock like half a dozen five year fours or whatever they are. Um, so I'll ask them that, and we'll just keep the thing on standby for well, not on standby. Sorry, we'll just keep the thing idling for, well for the majority of the day and just just check that everything's stable and the buyer stays where it should once everything warms up. And then uh, we'll put it back together and stick it in the, the box after giving it a clean and, and uh, let him know it's ready for pickup. Job done. About bloody time, eh?